if you have your Bible and you want to turn or you're writing notes, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 10 mostly. We're going to be, we have other, I have other scriptures, but we're going to be starting there. Daniel's story is very interesting. We're talking about prayer and fasting, and Pastor Daniel asked me, she said, so this is your Wednesday, what do you want to teach on? And I said, I'm going to talk about Daniel's fast what it's like to fast till a breakthrough, till an answer comes. And um, which is technically this was a 21-day fast. And that was what I was going to talk about. And the more I was getting into this, the more I went, all right, Lord, you really designed this for tonight. And um, often when we started this fast, it was a very planned thing. Everybody kind of designed what they were going to do. They heard from God what they were going to do and went into the fasting and doing whatever the Lord is leading you to do. And so it was planned. This fast that Daniel did was not planned. There are different kinds of fasts. There are fasts that you choose to go in to consecrate yourself to the Lord. Jesus, the Spirit of God, led him into the wilderness. And it was to consecrate himself and really prepare himself for ministry. It was actually a discipline. I think one of the things that we're missing often in the church is that we are called to be disciples of Christ. That means we should be very disciplined people. And why is the church so lazy? If we're disciplined people, there's a problem. We should be the most disciplined people in the world, and we aren't. Why? Because we're disciples, we should be very disciplined of the Lord. And yet, in the church, often when God speaks to us, we, God, please don't tell me to do that. We're not very disciplined, and, and there's something wrong with that. And again, I think that's where fasting comes in. Because it becomes a lifestyle then to begin to get disciplined in some areas in our life where we have allowed ourselves to be sloppy. My mother-in-law had a term. She called it sloppy agape. It was like just walking around in this attitude of I can just do whatever and God has grace on me. And we never really become what God wants us to be. We never are excellent in our walk with Christ. God wants more from us. He required more of the disciples, you guys. He did require more of them. As they got more mature in their walk, he required more of them. Go read Timothy and what was required of him as he stepped into ministry. Paul had a pretty big list of what was required. Read the book of James and what's required of us as believers. It's not, it's not an easy walk. That's why Jesus said, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. It's not a fun thing. But let me tell you, there's reward, far more reward than we understand, I think. So fasting and prayer has its own reward. It is a disciplinary thing. It actually brings maturity into our walk. But Daniel, when he fasted, this was not a consecration fast. This was a grief fast. A situation was happening, and Daniel, this happened to Daniel multiple times, so my guess is that Multiple times, he kind of went into this mode. I'm going to go pray about this and just take it to God. He came to this place in grief often. And what I mean is what, what's happening constantly with Daniel, he's in Babylon. He's been in Babylon since he was a teenager, probably around the age of 17. Um, he was under 18, obviously. He was not considered an adult. And so he was under the age of 30 for sure. But he was considered like a young young boy at the time. And he was brought into the king's area and he was raised. They were trying to Babylonize him, you know what I mean? Make him be like them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, what happened frequently in Babylon was the turnover of kings. Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, all these different... different um, Different kings were getting turned over and different things were happening. And when it happened, there would be bloodshed. People would get killed. This wasn't one of those, oh, this cabinet's just going to retire. No, they just slaughtered that cabinet and started over. 
And somehow in the middle of it, God preserved Daniel. He preserved him. And Daniel, I went and looked up because I was like, I wonder, I never even thought about this. How did Daniel die? Because he didn't die in the lion's den, obviously. He died of old age. He lived out his days. In fact, it's one of the promises in the answer that God gives him, that he would live out his days. So God preserved him because of his faithfulness to the Lord. And he lived out his entire of his days. Some people say somewhere in his 80s. Other people say he lived to be like 102. So, and there's a whole bunch of stuff, math in between that. And I'm not going to go into that tonight. It's not important. But what's important is he saw multiple kings between Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar at one point went completely crazy. Remember, he went out, acted like a dog in the field. So he had some crazy leaders too. And um, Cyrus became king of Persia. And one time it was Darius when he had the lion in the den experience. It was Darius. So there was just multiple times he had different leaders. And when this would happen and this conflict would rise, Daniel had to seek the face of God, not only for his own protection, but he was concerned about his people. Remember, it wasn't just him that was brought over there as a child. We see the three Hebrew boys previously and their story. So Daniel in chapter 10 Verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. That was his, uh, his Babylon name. And the word was true, and it referred to great tribulation, conflict, and wretchedness. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks. This was a grief that hit him. He went to the Lord and was in grief because he saw what was coming. He saw the changeover coming. And he saw what was going to happen. And it caused him to grieve in the presence of God. But listen to what he says. I ate no pleasant or desirable food, nor did any meat or wine come into my mouth. What this means is he more than likely went into more of like what that Daniel fast was, where it was very basic, probably lentils and vegetables and fruits and juice. And no wine coming into the mouth, so it wasn't even juice. It was water. So he basically ate what he needed to when he could. Now, and he did this and did not anoint himself for a full three weeks. That means he also stayed away from people because he didn't bathe. So I'm not suggesting that you do that. <laughs> but <laughs> he stayed away from people. Now I'm going to tell you something. I know that we have been very news hungry about what's going on in the world. But sometimes there is a grief that comes that you can't talk to people. You have to hear just from God for a season. And you have to close yourself off. And that's where Daniel was. He had to close himself off. He could not. He just could not interact. I told my mom the other day, I said, I don't want to be around people right now. I don't. I get in, I get out if I have to go into the store. I'm not real, I'm not real social right now. I have no desire to be on social media at all. None. Because my soul is grieved. And when my soul is grieved, I go there. I understood where Daniel was going. In fact, when I was reading this, I went, <sighs> I tried to count how many times I've been there. There's been multiple times in my life for different circumstances, different reasons, different things that put me into this kind of a fast. I understood it. I can't say that I counted the exact days. I, The one time I would say probably three months. I had a three-month media fast. And there was Facebook at the time. And the only thing I did on Facebook at all during those three months was put a scripture and I got off. I didn't have it on my phone. It was on my computer. That was a whole lot easier. I had a little flip phone at the time. 
and I never got on it for three months. I spent my time with the Lord for those three months. But I was in grief, and I was dealing with a lot. There is a time sometimes that God, pull, the Spirit of God will pull you into prayer, and it's not fun, but it's for a purpose and it's for a reason. Daniel was in grief, and he went to the presence of God daily for 21 days. And on the 24th day of the first month, as I was on the bank of the great river of Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with pure gold, of a, of a fez. His body also was a gold luster like burial, and his face had the appearance of lightning, and his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and his feet like glowing burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the noise of a multitude of people or a roaring of the sea. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision of this heavenly being, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. So at some point, he finally did probably wash up, and he was around a few people. But a great trembling fell upon them, so they fled and hid themselves. So while he's having this vision, the presence of the Lord is so around him that everyone runs away. And as I was left alone, I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. For my, fr my fresh, fresh appearance was turned to pallor, and I grew weak and faint with fright. And then I heard the sound of the words. When I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face sunk to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me unsteadily upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And the angel said to me, O Daniel, you are a greatly beloved man. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For you, to you, I am now sent. And while he was saying this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from, this, from the first day that you set your mind and your heart to understand and to humble, to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come as a consequence and as a response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, I want to stop there for a minute. He was not talking about the physical prince ruling over Persia. He was talking about a principality. This is an angel of the Lord speaking and talking about the principality over Persia. Remember, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers made a show of them openly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. He's not talking in the physical courts. He's talking in the heavenlies. He's talking between God's heaven, the third heaven, and our atmosphere. He's talking in that second heaven, right in that middle zone where the principalities of the powers of the air try to rule and reign. Yep. And then Michael, one of the chief and celestial princes, came, came to help me, for I remained there with the kings of Persia. So what it was is this was an angel that was sent to actually give him the answer, and he got stuck. And the other angels had to come and actually begin to battle to get the answer to him. So what took him, the minute he prayed, God sent the answer. But because of the war in the heavenlies, and this is why so often when we pray, we have to pray and really intercede something through. It's not just instant sometimes. And I'm going to show you why in a little bit. Now I have come to make you understand what is to befall your people. And, and in the latter days, for the vision is for many days yet to come. Now, I want to tell you something. I kind of got upset with God when I read this. I said, Lord, he wanted an answer for right then. Are you talking like latter days, like the end of days? Yeah, that's exactly what he was talking about. God's answer to Daniel, later on he tells Daniel that he's going to live out his days. You'll live out your days. So he gives Daniel some answer for today. He doesn't tell Daniel the now. 
he gives Daniel the answer for way in the future. And he actually shows Daniel. I'm going to talk this out because there's, it's quite a lot. He actually shows Daniel all the kingdoms that are going to come. Include, I mean, he goes down the list and shows him all these kingdoms that are coming, multiple rulers, and yet I'm going to still deliver the people, and this is where I'm going to send them. And he, it's a big, it's two chapters. We'd be here all night if I began to read it to you. Go and research it. It's a whole of a chapter, the rest of chapter 10, all of 11 and part of 12. That he begins to give him this real detailed, but it's still, it's, it's not, God's going to deliver him from Babylon right then. Hmm. Now, further down in chapter 10, verse 19, and he said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be to you, be strong. Yes, be strong. And when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I will return to fight with the hostile prince of Persia. And when I have called, behold, the hostile prince of Greece will come. He said, I'm going to go and fight, but I'm going to have to keep fighting. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of the truth or the book of truth. There is no one who holds with me and strengthens himself against these hostile spirit forces except for Michael, your prince, the National Guard of Ant angel okay now i want you to understand something first of all this is before the cross this is before jesus spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly we actually have dominion to pray call things down but you know there's still a war in the heavenlies because they still fight and act like they have control they don't they think they do so there is still times that we're going to have to pray, and we're going to have to pray things through. But God's answer to Daniel, I didn't like his answer. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was kind of disappointed. I read it, and I thought, Lord, why would you give Daniel this answer? He just wanted to know what was going to have him do his people right then. He didn't want you. No, God gave him an answer for the future. He actually, he pushed Daniel through time and showed him a whole bunch. He showed him his people being delivered all the way through it. You know what God began to show me? He said, Jasta, you know what I showed Daniel? I'm going to deliver your people so many times you're not even going to know how many times. Not just once. Because there was more than just Babylon, you guys. What happened when Rome came? He had to deliver him then. Multiple times God has had to deliver us. And often we want an answer right now for just this season. And God, don't give me any more. Just, I just want right now. You better tell me everything's going to be okay right now. God's answer often isn't what we like. It's kind of like I said this Sunday. What we often tell our kids is just follow me. Mom's in control. I got this. Just follow me. Dad's got this. Just trust me. And your kids are like, what are you doing? Why are you telling? It's the same thing. God was kind of giving Daniel this overview of, I'm going to keep saving my people all the way to the end. So don't be surprised by any of that. He's going to keep saving us. Hmm. In chapter 11, he begins to go through all these times of kingdoms. And there's a whole bunch of them. He talks about, he even gets through some of Rome and different, because he talks about Antipas and just, or not Antipas, but um, oh, what is his name? The one that had the garrison there in any way. I can't think of his name. One of them. And he's, so he's talking about one of the ones that was destroyed. And he talks about them. And in the Amplified, what's cool is it actually tells you who they're talking about. He talks about Alexander the Great. He just literally goes through 
a whole bunch of these. Verse 35 in chapter 11. Okay, so he talks, actually, verse 30, he's talking about they will come into the Roman hands. So I thought that was really interesting. He actually gets to the Rome, Romans, and he talks about Palestine. He talks about the Jews. He talks about what's going to happen. Then he gets into some of this. Now, this is where it fast forwards. He actually starts to talk about the Antichrist. He actually gets in to part of this where he's talking about this world leader who's going to cause this uh, this horrible time in the, in the temple. So in verse 35, And some of them who were wise, prudent, and understanding shall be weakened and fall. And thus then the insincere among the people who lose courage and become deserters, it will be a test. I started to think about today. And I could hear the Lord saying this. This will be a test to refine, to purify, to make those among God's people white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for the time God appointed. There is a test. We've talked about this. There is a test coming on the earth. And Jesus said in Revelation that he would, he would keep us from it. He would keep us in the middle of the test. He would secure us. And it's coming to try the whole earth. Different nations have had tests. And I could name you different ones that have. China has had horrible tests over the years. The Christians there have been truly tested and tried. Africa, most of the, all, all the third world countries have had major tests. America and Israel are the two I think that are going to be tested right now. When we don't stand next to Israel, who does? That's what I see. And I told the Lord, I said, do I speak what I see? Because it's what I see. I'm very careful to not speak. I heard a minister say that the church was going to go into Babylon, and I instantly went, I don't hear God saying that. What I hear him saying is you're going to have a choice to be like Daniel. Because this whole world is going to be Babylon. It isn't just us, you guys. This is an hour of testing that's coming on the earth. The whole earth was looking to us to see what was going to happen. Something is coming. But we will stand we will stand. I'm not freaking out. I'm not freaking out at all. I'm actually, I was sad. I can tell you I was grieved today. I don't think I've ever cried at an inauguration. I didn't watch it. I, I said no. Because I know I would grieve and I would weep. And so I didn't. But I still grieved and I still wept. And I, I began to read Daniel and I said, Lord, I know how he feels. I get it. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to be in my room and be with the Lord and just be away from everybody because it was grieving. Am I in fear? No. Am I in panic? Absolutely not. Grief, yeah. Grief is different, but I'm also believing the Lord. And he gave Daniel a very specific word that he would save his people. Actually, when I begin to read this, what I realize is he didn't give just Daniel an answer for the now. He gave Daniel an answer consistently that every time this happens, I am going to deliver my people. And I sat back and went, that is a bigger answer than even what Daniel was asking for. Daniel was asking just for the now. How often do we ask just for God for, just give me this tidbit. But God gave him even an even bigger answer. He said, I will always deliver them. I will always be there. In Daniel 12, verse 1, he says this. He says, and at the time of the end, Michael shall arise 
the great angelic prince who defends and has charge over your Daniel's people. And there shall be a time of trouble, straightness, and distress, such as never has been or since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, and every one whose name shall be found written in the book of God's plan for his own. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt and abhorrence. But to many of those who sleep, he's talking about the resurrection. And I love what he says. He says, but at that time your people shall be delivered. So again, he's giving them hope over and over. He shows them that your people are going to last all the way to the ends of the age. And I'm going to deliver them again. We needed that promise tonight in the middle of all this. It may not be the answer we wanted. But no matter what, God is still God. And I'm going to trust him. That's just the way it goes. I'm not, I'm not leaving my post on it. I have some pretty strong opinions. I have shared my opinions. People know where I stand, and I ain't budging. That's just how I, that's where I'm at. I'm not budging on it. I went on last night, and I posted my opinions, and I said it very firm. Unlike a lot of other believers who want to weenie out right now and not have a spine and bow down and kiss people's toes so they can save their own necks, I will not. And I will say it from here, just like I did from there. I'm not doing it, you guys. I'm not bowing. I stood for something. I will still stand. It's just right where I'm at. And I don't care if it costs me my life, because my life ain't my own anyway. I died to myself a whole long time ago. It doesn't really matter to me. Something, I, I, I just will not bow to the evil and I will not align myself people talk about unity Jesus never unified himself with Roman rulers you know when Jesus was standing there and they were they had beaten him and Pilate was getting ready to wash his hands of him Jesus didn't look at him and go Pilate can we just have unity man he didn't plead for unity from the Pharisees, who he had once called them the son of the devil. They were vipers. They were the sons of Satan. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. But Jesus, he told us to make peace with everybody. Well, he didn't make peace with them. I said something a couple weeks ago, and I, I have been saying it, and I'm going to keep saying it. If you make unity with the devil, you lose your soul. My job is not to make peace with evil. It's to call evil what it is. And John the Baptist called it what it was. It costed him his life, you guys. But Jesus called him the greatest prophet. John called evil what it was. He called out the Roman ruler for what he was. Jesus called out the rulers in the church. Because they weren't really rulers serving God. They were rulers for Rome. They really weren't godly. Listen, you can go into a church and take communion. But if your heart is far from the Lord, trust me. Let's talk it about the abomination of desolation. That is one. That is ridiculous. When you can kill a baby in the womb the day that it's born, and then you can go take communion and say it's holy, you are unholy. But God knows. He sees it, you guys. Nothing escapes his eyes. And I'm not going to bow with it. I'm not going to side with it. I'm not going to have unity with it. No, I'm going to keep calling it what it is. It's sin and it's wrong. And that's where I stand. There are multiple reasons to fast. Grief is definitely one of them. 
I want to share as I close tonight a little bit about some of the different places that you can, or different ways that you can fast. Number one, to strengthen your prayer life. Again, I talked about discipline. We often are very undisciplined. We get saved and we kind of get sloppy in our grace. We get sloppy in our, our God's love, which is agape. We, we get sloppy in it because, well, God will love me anyway. But we're disciples. We're supposed to be like him. You know, they didn't call themselves Christians in Acts. The world called them Christians. The world saw them and said, you look like Christ, you act like Christ, you're Christians. We call ourselves Christians, and it's almost out of an arrogance. Well, I'm a Christian. Are you really? Just because you go again and go take communion, no, you're not. And you can't call yourself a Christian when the truth is, is you worship another false god. Like a Buddha. Or a Hindu god. Because there's a few of those people that went and took communion today. That's what they do. You can't worship two masters, remember? You love one and you reject the other. This is a time that we discipline ourselves and we strengthen ourselves. Ezra... Chapter 8, verse 23 talks about this, if you want to write that verse down. Dad, you can pull it up. To seek God for guidance, number two, we also seek God's guidance. Judges, uh, chapter 20, verse 26. Sometimes during fasting, we are simply going and asking God for wisdom and what he wants us to do. What do you want us to do next? Where are we supposed to go? 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 13. Here's another instance, not just Daniel, where when he fasted, he fasted out of grief. Sometimes it can be because someone's passing away. Sometimes it's a grief because there's something happening and it's causing great turmoil. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 12 was another time that there was great mourning and weeping. And again, people fasted and prayed during their time of grief. Number four, to seek for deliverance and protection. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3 through 4. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast. When Jehoshaphat saw the armies coming after him, before they even went to send the worshipers out in order to get wisdom and also for protection and deliverance from this army coming against him, he called a fast. And that's when the Lord put it on his heart to begin to send out the worshipers. Verse 5, to express repentance and return to God. Do you ever know that repentance is not just an apology? For Samuel 7, 6. Repentance is not just an apology. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Thank you. Sometimes you know that your life is so messed up that repentance is a time that you pour yourself out and you repent and you grieve and you fast until you know that that you're not your own anymore. You've truly given yourself to the Lord. This is what you would have seen in Nineveh. Nineveh was told about a coming disaster, that God was going to take the city out. And they went into a grieving and a repentance that brought the whole city into a fasting, including the king, and God spared them. So another time of fasting, to humble oneself before God, to consecrate yourself, to bring holiness into your life. 1 Kings chapter 21. When Ahab heard those words of Elijah, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went quietly. He began to pull himself aside. To express concern for the work of God. 
Nehemiah 1, 3 through 4. This was a time, remember, Nehemiah was trying to build the wall, and they were trying to rebuild Jerusalem. Nehemiah called for fasting and prayer while they were in the process of this building. This was a time to fast and pray over the work that they were doing. We saw this when Pastor Daniil taught on when they would go into a town and do a revival. Remember praying Nash, and he would go into the town prior, and he would pray over the work that was going to be done in the town. So again, he was praying for the work of God. Number eight, to minister to the needs of others. Isaiah 58 Why have we fasted, they say, and do, um, you do not see it? Why have we afflicted ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, O Israel, on the day of your fast, when you should be grieving for your sins or find profit in your business, and instead of stopping all the work, as the law implies, you and your workmen should do, you exhort from your hired servants a full amount of labor. See, they were supposed to be fasting. The facts are that you fast only for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Fasting as you do today will not cause your voice to be heard on high. What he was showing them is you were they were fasting for all the wrong reasons. Sometimes God calls us a fast because he wants us to begin to see what someone else is going through. To overcome temptation and dedicate yourself to God. We see this in Matthew. This is Jesus. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he, before he was tempted, he fasted first. Now we know he drank water. He fasted food. Because it, he wasn't thirsty at the end. He was hungry. Now if you're going to do a 40-day fast, this is... One of the biggest fasts, and I know my mother-in-law did this, and I'm telling you, you have to not only drink water, you have to drink some kind of juice because you'll get very, very weak. And you have to keep your strength up. And so the Lord actually led her through this. She actually drank, like, some V8 and some other juices. It wasn't just clear liquids. She did clear liquids, I think, for one week, and then she had to put some of those broths and things into her diet. But she did it for a full 40 days. And when she did, she actually would leave home and she would go up to the church into her office and get away from everybody. This wasn't something she just fasted food. No, she spent the entire time in prayer too. It was a real dedication type of a thing. And I've never been able to do that. <laughs> her kids were older and they weren't living at home anymore. I will say that. You can't do that when you have small kids. You just can't. I did fast when my kids were young, and I did it when they were in school. When they came home, I had to be mom. You know, I had to come out of the room. I had to do what I do. God understands that, you guys. Listen, he does. He gets it. He does not expect you to leave your kids fending themselves for, for themselves for 40 days so you can go to the mountain. He'll meet you at the kitchen sink. Just telling you, okay? Because he has done that for me. To express love and worship for God. Sometimes this is just a time of, God, I want to spend more time with you. I just want to set aside for myself, Luke chapter 2, verse 37. I just want to spend more time with you. I want to seek your face. Anna did this when she was waiting to see Jesus, waiting to see him be born and come to the temple. And she was just waiting on God. And she would just worship day and night, and she would fast, and she would pray. This is also a time of consecration and holiness and being separate unto God. I know that the fast started out for those reasons. I think the next few weeks, we will probably go into the grief side of it right now. And I could feel the grief. Until God answers, until something is made clear. I think that's where we are, church. And I could see Daniel and what he went through. But our answer from God may not be, yes, it's going to be this and it's tomorrow. Our answer from God may be, I will preserve you. 
I will keep you. I will deliver you. I will keep delivering you. I will keep you in the hour of testing that's coming on the whole earth. I hung on to those words today. I will keep you. When you walk through the waters, they will not drown you. When you walk through the fire, you will not feel it. And that was the words I heard too, over and over in my spirit today. And I know God's holding us all, you guys. And I know we weep and we grieve. Be careful what you share, because I'll tell you what, there's people that are angry. My husband already got swore at by somebody for something he shared. So just saying. I, I, I would stay off the media, and I would fast it as much as you can. I will stand with the word of God. So Daniel, something Jasta didn't say, we've come 180. You are Daniel. Now I understand why God said, call a fast. Whatever fast you choose, call a fast. And my first thought was Daniel. Jasta said to me, and you may want to finish this statement. You're Daniel. You've come 180. You stand at a time where you say, God, I don't know what's happening. You've pulled yourself back. You've committed yourself to pray. Please bathe. <laughs> Some of you will guard what you eat. God will actually take desires out of you as you become faithful. You're not hungry for that, whatever it is. Something you were really hungry for, you did really well with, he'll go, uh-uh, pull that back. I don't want that. And you'll begin to listen to him because you're at this point. And you're asking God, God, what's going on? God, I want deliverance for our people. And you'll recognize, and when uh, Pastor Jassa shared that with me, We've come 180. We stand in the place of Daniel. Just a no. We're at the last days where General Daniel had said, God told him it'd be at the very last days. We're the ones at the last days looking backwards at Daniel going, whoa, you were talking about us? You're talking about us? He's looking ahead, and he's seeing Jordan Rivers and the people there. He's looking ahead, seeing America. He's looking ahead and seeing those that are blood-bought, redeemed, and born again. He's looking ahead at Israel. And he's prophesying. In those latter days, this is what's going to happen. So as you stand like Daniel stood... Understand this. I have no clue where God's going. What he said is, it's my turn now. He also assured me that the people rejoice when righteousness rules the nation. The word of this hour is do not back down. If Daniel had quit on the 19th day, some of you are 10 days into prayer and fasting. Some of you are into four days because you started Sunday. Some of you said today or last Wednesday. Some of you two weeks ago. I don't know what day you're in. But had he quit on the 15th day and said, you know what? This is getting too long. I have not had my Cheetos in a while. And uh, I'm really starting to get hungry, and um, I need a monster drink, you know. Uh, Pastor, do you think it'd be okay if I just quit early? I'm just going to talk to God, not me. I'm not the one in charge of your life. I'm not in charge of you fasting and praying. I'm not even in charge for you that just skip one, have to fast a meal, and you're reading the word. Well, you know, it's kind of getting long there. You know, I'm in, I, I'm in the book of Acts, and, you know, there's 32 chapters. 
And I, I can only just do so much. And I really don't have time at night for this. I don't really care. It's between you and God, not me. You want to quit early, don't even tell me. I'm okay. But if Daniel had quit on the 15th day, he said, it's too much for me to take. I cannot do this. God has not answered me yet, and I am throwing in the towel. I don't know what's happening. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what's, what, what you're doing, God. I'm looking ahead. We would have never had the answer you have tonight. Where Daniel said, ah, and God spoke. He said, this is where we're going. 21 days into it, the angel appears said, man, you have no idea. I have been battling. You have no idea how hard this was. I had to withstand the prince of Persia, the principalities and powers. I had to go in there and fight for that answer for you, but it was released the first day. So don't you dare pack your bags up and say, I quit. You stand and you say, God, this is a time I might pull myself aside for silence. Facebook might not be it. Like I said, I'm only posting if I post something that I think you need to know. In fact, sometimes I'll put something on and it's there for one hour and I take it down. Whoever saw it, saw it. You know, <laughs> I'm serious. Um, the ones, that, the articles I have on there now are on there. But I am going to be diligent to stand. So don't expect Nick and I to weenie out. Don't expect Pastor Jasta to weenie out, Matt, the rest of you. I don't expect any of you to. You're all too stubborn. Amen. You're all too strong. And if you think you're not, then you better get a little strength. I actually was physically weak today with all that was going on. I was physically weak. I wasn't sure if it was spiritual, physical, or emotional. But I felt an overwhelming urge to just have a good cry. <laughs> and God says, okay. Have a good cry. But you need to know I'm in the middle of that cry. And I ain't left you. So when I come over the top of the hill and I looked at the sunset, I went, whoa. Those are unusual colors tonight. Vibrant. Vibrant. He said, that's just for you. I just want you to know I ain't left. I created that sunset. I'm the maker of the heavens. I'm the painter of the skies. I ain't left my kids. So it's good to know God. So we will endure. Remember the message, endure. Sunday, I ha Sunday I have a message. I'm holding on it. You don't know how hard it is to hold on something that God gives you. I'm holding because he's not done speaking to me. And I, I'm holding on it. God bless you. God bless you tonight. And, and Nick will receive it. Father, I thank you. What a day. I don't understand it all, Lord, yet. But I know I know you, and I trust you. And you gave a distinct word that said it's your turn. So, Father, I rest in knowing and I trust you that you have a plan that I can't see. And then in the middle of all this, as we endure, because of our patience, as we endure, you said you would keep us in the hour of testing that would come and try the whole earth. I thank you for keeping us. God, put a hedge of protection around our people and our families. Bring every one of our kids back to you, God. Whatever you got to do. Whatever you have to do to bring them to that place of salvation, Jesus. Pursue them. Let nothing of the enemy thwart them. Come in their way. Stop them. Try to uh, detour them to come from coming back to you. 
and no ungodly influences. God, break them off. We call them home. We call them back to righteousness. We call them back to Jesus. In Jesus' name. God, thank you for saving them, delivering them, redeeming them, restoring them, and healing them. In the name of Yeshua, your son Jesus. May the angels of God go before you, surround you. The blood of Jesus cover you. And the glory of the Lord be your rear guard. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.